with you involved. Let me pray for us and we'll, we'll jump in this morning. Father, we thank you that you are a God who, before the foundation of the world, you had a plan to restore humanity back to yourself. God, our stories intersect with your overarching story in a beautiful way. You invite us to not only live within your redemptive purposes, but to share this story, God, with people who desperately need to know you. So God, help us in that endeavor this morning. Inspire us to think creatively of how we can reach people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my name is Stephen. If I haven't had the privilege of meeting you, I serve as uh, one of the pastors here. And I got the privilege, my wife and I, um, along with our family, to go to Walt Disney World this past week. It was awesome. So cool. Um, you know, one of my favorite moments, I got to ride on Space Mountain with my mom and my nine-year-old son, which was so much fun. Um, my, my two girls, or my, my three girls got to uh, be with Rapunzel and Cinderella. I mean, those are the moments that, uh, as a, or Tiana and Rapunzel, let me not, not get those ones confused, okay? Um, but those are the moments as, as parents that you, you, know, you, you cherish. Uh, but as I was you know, experiencing Disney World, uh, it got me thinking, like, what is the power of Disney? The magic of Disney? I mean, people joke about the thousands of dollars that they spend for this one day or multi-day experience. There's almost like a, an aura. There's like a, this like something in the air that makes you just want to pour out money and make memories and you know, see these great characters. And we're watching this parade at around noon. And um, you know, there are all the famous characters are there. And I got a snapshot of the story that is Disney. Now, there are specific you know, stories, Cinderella and Toy Story and all these stories, but, but there's kind of an overarching story that Disney is telling. And they said it right there in the parade. I can't remember who it was, one of the princesses. I mean, they just rattled it off one by one. Be true to yourself. Nothing is impossible if you believe. Follow your heart. Love conquers all. Now, this morning, I'm not going to dissect that storyline. We'll save that for another sermon, whether that's true or not true. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to is the power of story, the power of story, that we as a family would uh, get to the park at 8 a.m. and not leave till 10 p.m., carting around, you know, nine-year-old, seven-year-old, five-year-old, three-year-old, because of the power of story. It draws you in. No one forces you to go to Disney World, right? Nobody's twisting your arm. You're, at least we were, we were drawn by the story. And the power of story is why we root for sports teams, why we buy certain brands, why we're attached to certain things because something is being communicated bigger than ourselves, even if it's, it's not something overt that we wanna be a part of, that captures our imagination. We're starting a series, a two-part, two-Sunday series uh, today called Story. And what we're looking at today is really the story of the gospel, the story or the meta narrative of Scripture. And, and our role in that story, not only our role, but how we can share that story with those around us. And, you know, today... Um, I want to look at a little bit of, of why we don't tell that story more often. I want to talk through maybe a key, one important key to sharing the story and look at a very unlikely place. We're going to look at the book of Ezekiel today. And then finally, we're going to kind of dream a little bit. We're going to dream. Uh, I, my goal today is not necessarily even to have you do anything. I just want you to start thinking about ways that you can tell the story. Next week is going to be more the doing. Pastor David is just, he's an incredible evangelist. Uh, he, is, he is anointed by God and, and sharing the good news with people. So he's really going to empower you to go out and do. But today, I just want to begin the conversation. I want us to just to think about the story and how we can share it. And if you're here today, maybe you're not a Christian, let me assure you, you, you couldn't have picked a better Sunday to come. Because you're going to get like a, a backstage pass uh, of what the Christian message is really all about. 
So first, I have some notes. Normally when I, when I preach, we, I preach uh, what's called exegetically, meaning we'll take one passage, we'll, we'll kind of dive deep into it, expound upon it, because generally that's the most effective way to read your Bible. You can, you can kind of cherry pick, pick verses and, and look up you know, 20, 30, 50, 100 verses all throughout Scripture, but it's hard to really get the context it's hard to get the historical background. It's hard to understand the original author's meaning when you're kind of jumping around. So generally, when you read the Bible, you want to read maybe you know, a passage or a book of the Bible. Um, and so normally when, when I preach on a Sunday or most people you know, preach on a Sunday, you're gonna, we're unpacking one story or going through a book of the Bible. We're going to do that after Easter. We're going to go through the book of 1 John, just kind of verse by verse. But today I want to preach more topically, more um, linearly. In fact, I have, you guys get these notes? Some of you, I mean, if you're kind of nerdy like I am, you're super excited. Maybe if you're more creative, you're like, man, I picked the wrong Sunday to come to church. Um, But we're going to have fun regardless, whatever camp that you're in. So first, we have been given the most beautiful, transformative, urgent story. Christianity is often limited to a bunch of do's and don'ts. Do, do this, don't do that. But really, Christianity at its heart is a story of God redeeming humanity back to himself, of sending his son Jesus who died and rose again. That storyline that any person who repents and believes of the gospel can become a part of the body of Christ, can become a part of the family of God, that Jesus is going to come back for a pure and spotless bride is a storyline that changes people's hearts, that can draw even the worst of sinners, and it can affect change in cities and workplaces and families. We have been given a beautiful, transformative urgent story. Paul said it like this in Romans 1.16. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation. How many of you believe that no person is too far from the power of God? I love that. No matter who I meet, because all of us at one point were far from God and he saved us through the gospel. Most popular verse in in all the Bible, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him can have eternal life. What story promises eternal life? That you're going to live forever with God in paradise if you believe in Christ. That's the story we've been given. Now, here's the problem. Let me illustrate through, through a story of my own. When I was in high school, I was, I was known as a Christian. I was pretty outspoken about my faith in certain pockets of my friends. But I played on a basketball team. Uh, don't be overly impressed. We went like 2-21. and 21. We were terrible. Um, and so, you know, the team wasn't that great. And, and there was this one guy on our team um, who I won't share his name just in case one day he, he watches his sermon. But, um, but he would show up to the game tipsy. I, I don't know if we were 2 and 21 because he was doing things like that, or he was doing things like that because we were 2 and 21. I, I don't know, but um, let's just say he was the guy that if there was a most unlikely to get saved uh, accolade in high school, it would be this guy, okay? Um, and I ran into him in the mall a couple years after I graduated from high school, and we were kind of catching up, and um, you know, I made a comment about Jesus, and he said, wait, wait, wait. He said, you're a Christian. I said, yeah, man. He's like, no way. He said, I just became a Christian. I said, wow, that's amazing. He said, you know, it's funny. He said, I always knew you were a nice guy, but I didn't know you were a Christian. It was like he had dug a sword in my heart because I had realized that although I was living like a Christian, at least for the basketball team in terms of things that I wasn't doing, I wasn't sharing the story. And so I left the story up for them to figure out on their own. And he had come up with the conclusion that, well, it must be because Stephen's a really nice guy. I have found in talking to many of you that when I ask, you know, hey, what are you doing to maybe share the gospel or to talk to people about Jesus? A common refrain that I hear is, well, I just let my actions do the talking, right? I think all of us have maybe thought that at one point. Like, 
I, my hope is that I'm just going to, you know, be the best Christian I can be. And I'm not going to say anything, but if somebody asks me, then I'll tell them. The problem is, how many of you have ever been approached by someone, hey, tell me why you're a Christian? It's very rare, right? And so most people can go, I mean, they can go years without even knowing that their coworker, their family member is a Christian. Now, here's, the, here's a little bit of statistics to kind of prove what I'm saying here that the American church, by and large, is silent. Now, very gifted evangelist named Lee Strobel, who wrote a book called Case for Christ, he was a legal editor of the Chicago Tribune, he started researching the resurrection, and as a result, came to know Jesus. And so he has some statistics here. 86, it takes 86 church members, on average, one year to lead one person to Christ in America. So we have about 80. I would say around 86 people that are members of this church have gone through the membership process. According to Lee Strobel, it'll take all of us one year to lead one person to Christ. 60% of Protestant churches in America are either plateaued or declined. Half, over half of the churches in America saw fewer than 10 conversions last year. 3% of North American churches are growing through evangelism. It's possible to grow like crazy, but just to grow through transfer growth. Meaning people like your version of church, they like your worship team, they like the preaching, so they leave their church, they come to you, or they move in from the area, they're already Christians, and a church is growing like crazy but never leading anyone to Jesus. Only 3% of North American churches are growing through evangelism. Barna, which is a Christian research organization, they did a study that showed 47% of millennial Christians think it's actually wrong to share your faith. Not only do they not show their faith, but they think it's wrong. It's too invasive. It's too pushy. So here's the irony. We live in a city known for, around the world, Washington, D.C., is known for speaking out. I mean, if you have a cause, you go to D.C., and yet the church is silent. I did a quick Wikipedia search here on some of the most uh, populated demonstrations, protests, marches on the National Mall, Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, the march on, on Washington had 250,000 people in attendance. 1969, 600,000 people came to the National Mall to protest the Vietnam War. 1978, 100,000 marched for women's rights. 1987, the National March on Washington for lesbian and gay rights, 500,000 in attendance. 2011, Rally for Life, 700,000 in attendance. Mass movements come to D.C. to lift their voices. And yet we as a church have been given the greatest story and we don't say anything. So why are we as Christians silent when everyone else is shouting? Now, just think about it for yourself for a moment. What keeps you from sharing the gospel more often? I list a couple reasons here in your handouts. Rejection, right? Nobody likes to get rejected. And yet Jesus says that a servant's not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll also persecute, persecute you. Rejection is a part of our portion as believers because our Savior was rejected. Ignorance, now that's a legitimate reason, right? You, maybe you feel like you don't have the story. It's hard, to, it's hard to share the story if you don't know the story, right? Maybe you're afraid that somebody will ask you a question that you don't know or point out something that you weren't aware of. Peter says, always be prepared to make a defense. So there is an element of us needing to know this story, to study, to show ourselves approved. You have discouragement. The reality is the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So we can pray for folks, we can share the gospel, and sometimes years go by, we don't see any fruit, we get discouraged and we stop. Embarrassment. We live in a very pluralistic society where the only thing that's not tolerated is you saying that there's one way to God. And yet our faith is exclusive. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So these are legitimate barriers. These are things that keep us from sharing the gospel. But this story is so good that we got to overcome these. Amen? Amen. And so I want to draw your attention to a very peculiar book today in order to help us overcome some of these obstacles. It's the book of Ezekiel. Now, Ezekiel, 
Um, what we're going to do today is kind of jump around to a lot of different parts of Ezekiel rather than just maybe reading one passage in Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a strange book, okay? Um, in fact, I heard one Old Testament scholar say that generally when people read through the Bible in a year, they give up in one of two places, either in Leviticus or Ezekiel. If you can get through Leviticus, you're, you're doing good. Then you get to Ezekiel, 48 chapters. It's a bit confusing because the setting is changing in different places. The timeline isn't necessarily chronological. You got Ezekiel who's laying on his side. He's cooking food over animal waste. He's cutting his hair. He's not mourning the, wife of, mourning the death of his wife. I mean, it is a bizarre book. Often prophetic books are a little bit, a little bit bizarre. We'll talk about why here in a moment. But there are some very keen similarities between Ezekiel's day and his situation and the day that we live in. Ezekiel was taken captive to Babylon with the first wave of exiles on his 30th birthday. And that's significant because as a male priest, you started your service at the age of 30. So Ezekiel would have been stepping into his calling as a priest, and then the temple's destroyed. And now he's taken to Babylon. He's living in exile. He's discouraged because around his nation, there's idolatry, there's injustice, there's innocent blood being shed. God reveals to him that Jerusalem will be destroyed. He's told that he's going to be rejected, that no one's going to listen to his message. And he's, he's living in a pluralistic society of Babylon where they're worshiping all these various gods. So Ezekiel was commanded to give an incredibly hard message to a people who didn't want to receive it. You can see this here under uh, Ezekiel's hard message. Ezekiel was handed a scroll, a prophetic message. And here's, the, here's what his message consists of, given to him by God. Lamentation, mourning, and woe. Now, as a pastor, I love to get up here and encourage you and hopefully share something that's going to inspire you and, you know, you're going to leave a little bit happier. But Ezekiel's told, here's what I want you to do. Just preach the incoming judgment and woe that the people will experience. Ezekiel was told to prophesy to the mountains. During that time, when, when a people entered into a covenant, they would call upon witnesses to observe the covenant. And so God says, look, there are no credible witnesses, so I'm just going to use the mountains as a witness to this covenant and how you've broken it. It says in Ezekiel 6, 4 through 7, God says, I will lay the dead bodies of the people of Israel before their idols. I will scatter your bones around your altars. Wherever you dwell, the city shall be laid waste. Verse 7, the slain shall fall in your midst. Ezekiel's told Ezekiel 11, prophesy against the people. Ezekiel 12, God tells Ezekiel, tell the people, they're going to go into exile. They're going to go into captivity. You, son of man, will you judge, will you judge the bloody city? Then declare, declare to her all of her abominations. This was a hard message that Ezekiel was given. And not only was it a hard message, he was delivering it to a people who had hard hearts. You ever seen it like a toddler fight against their parents because they don't want to take various you know, medicine, right? I mean, that's what's going on here. Ezekiel sent to a stubborn, rebellious people. Ezekiel chapter 2, he said to me, son of man. I send you to the people of Israel, to nations of rebels who've rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against them to, against me to this very day. The descendants also are impotent and stubborn. I send you to them, and you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God. And here's what God says to Ezekiel. The house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you. Later on, he calls them a rebellious house. Now, my wife and I, we were sent to Washington, D.C. to start Grace Covenant Church Capitol Hill with a team of 40 people. And we came here with a bold vision to see this community impacted by the gospel, to see salvations, to see people get baptized. We are full of faith. We were then, we still are now full of faith of seeing God work. But what if God said, hey, I'm sending you to Capitol Hill. Nobody's going to listen to your message. The church is not going to grow. And in fact, it's going to be the hardest thing you're ever going to do in your, your entire life. 
I'm like, well, can I take another assignment? Right? <laughs> Ezekiel, though, was responsible. Despite how hard the message was, despite how hard the people's hearts were that he was to deliver this message, he was responsible for delivering that message. That's the role of a messenger. A messenger is not responsible for how the message is received. A messenger is responsible for delivering the message as it was given. So I want you to feel the weightiness of this in Ezekiel chapter 3. This is God speaking to Ezekiel. This is him commissioning him. He says, if I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him no warning, Ezekiel, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way, In order to save his life, that wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Ezekiel, if you don't share this message, you're going to be held responsible. Unless you think this is just, you know, like an Old Testament concept, Paul really kind of echoes these these words when he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, For I preach the gospel that gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Listen to what he says. Woe to me. Woe to me. Judgment to me if I don't preach the gospel. Paul recognized this gospel message, this glorious message, was not his to withhold. Just as he had freely received, he was to freely give it. We are responsible for sharing this gospel with the lost and dying world around us. So here's Ezekiel's challenge. How do you share a hard message with a people who don't want to hear it when your life is on the line? And in many ways, isn't that our challenge here in Washington, D.C.? We have this beautiful gospel story, but it is a hard message. It's a message that says that you're so messed up, you need a sinner. Now, if, you're in, if you recognize your need, it's a great message. But if you think you don't have a need, if you think you're self-sufficient, it's an offensive message. People here in, in, in D.C. are generally apathetic or maybe too busy or too smart for this message. But we've been commanded by Jesus to go and to make disciples, to deliver this message that God has given us, this gospel message. So what is the key? And here's what I think we can learn from Ezekiel. The power of creative storytelling. Now, we're going to dive into some of the bizarreness of this book here. Ezekiel is given five, uh, well, five that we're going to look at today, enacted scenes or synax. So essentially, this is like street theater. And I, and I put a picture in there from uh, the Bible project that kind of illustrates some of these scenes. So Those of you who are more visually inclined can see some of these. But we're going to walk through these five here. The first is Ezekiel is told to create a model siege scene. So God says, okay, uh, Jerusalem's going to be ransacked. And um, here's the problem, Ezekiel, is that nobody's reading my word anymore. So I'm going to have you act this out so people can see it. And so Ezekiel, verse for their, or chapter 4, verse 1, You, son of man, take a brick, lay it before you, engrave on it a city, even Jerusalem, and put siege works against it. Build a siege wall against it and cast up a mountain against it. Set camps also against it and plant battering rams against it all around. And you take an iron griddle and place it as an iron wall between you and the city and set your face toward it and let it be in a state of siege and press the siege against it. This is a sign for the house of of Israel. Here's what I want you to do, Ezekiel, make a blockbuster movie. They didn't have movies back then. But essentially, God's saying, well, if my people are not going to read my word, I want you to to enact it. And even today, we live in a day and age of biblical illiteracy. Most folks, they don't know David and Goliath anymore. They don't know some of the basic storylines. In fact, when I was in college, I talked to a Chinese student about Jesus. He'd never heard the name of Jesus. And so when you live in a biblical, illiterate culture, God starts to inspire people to tell stories a different way. I think that's a part of the rise of some of the movies and TV shows, like The Passion or God's Not Dead or The Chosen. It's God's God's saying, well, if if people are not going to read my word, I'm going to get my message out there in a different medium. Secondly, God says, lie. Ezekiel, here's what I want you to do. I want you to lie on your side. Now, this this is bizarre. 390 days, Ezekiel is to lay on his side, and then 40 days on the other side. 
You know what's being enacted here? Is Ezekiel was acting as Israel's scapegoat. Now, if you were at service here a couple weeks ago, we talked about during our holiness series, we talked about the Day of Atonement. So this might be familiar to you. But Israel, uh, one day of year, Day of Atonement, a priest would have two animals, and one would be a scapegoat. And all the sins of, that, of the people were placed on this animal symbolically, and it was cast out into the wilderness. Well, Ezekiel is demonstrating that act by lying down on his side and being uh, bound, that all the sins of the people, are, it's, it's an enactment of what the people deserve. So here he is lying on his side, and he's eating food cooked on animal dump. I mean, this is like a spectacle, like a New York City subway panhandler, right? I mean, this is just, but God's trying to get the attention of his people. Thirdly, he says, Ezekiel, I want you to get a haircut. Cut your beard, cut your hair. And he was to divide, he was to cut his hair in three different parts. One part, he was to burn in the fire. Another part, uh, he was to strike with the sword. Another part was he, he was supposed to scatter to the wind. And it symbolized the fate of the people when they were besieged by the Babylonians. Now, uh, when we started this church, uh, kind of coincidentally, maybe prophetically, I got a man bun. Because I needed a pioneering look. I was ready, we were ready to pioneer, to start something new. But this is a, this is a whole other level. Ezekiel's told, here, cut off your hair. I want even your haircut to prophesy as to what I'm going to do amongst your people. Fourthly, God tells him to carry his bag like an exile, to dramatize, the, uh, to dramatize what the people were about to experience in captivity. Fifthly, there's finally some hope. Now, if you read the book of Ezekiel, starting in chapter 33, if you can get through all the judgment, there's some hope. Okay? So the last, the last kind of sign act is God says, I want you to take two sticks and write on it for Judah, write on it for, for Joseph or, or Israel, and join the sticks together because I'm going to bring my people back together. And as much as the message that we've been given is hard, that we need a Savior, that we're so messed up that God had to send His own Son to die for us, it ends in hope that anyone, despite our rebellion against God, that anyone who believes in Christ can have eternal life that God is a loving God. Even these, these prophecies of judgment in these synacts were meant to draw the people back to him. And even the book of Ezekiel, as bizarre as it is, as full as it is of judgment and woe and lamentation, it ends with hope. It ends with what God wants to do to restore his people and to draw his people back to God. Listen, we've been given the most beautiful, transformative, urgent gospel message. It's a message of hope. It's a message that any person, regardless of their, their race, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their socioeconomic background, regardless of their lack of morality, they can come to know Jesus through the saving work of Christ. We've been given this story. Now, I'm not suggesting this morning that you lie on your side, dye your hair pink. This was kind of a different era in redemptive history. God would use his prophets to do very bizarre things to get his people's attention. But I think there's a principle that we can draw from Ezekiel that applies today. The power of inspired creativity. To convey a hard message to a hardened people. God inspires his people to tell the story in creative ways. I want to encourage you songwriters, you dancers, you musicians, you creatives, you're at the tip of the spear. You're the modern day evangelist because in this hardened culture, the arts have a way of penetrating through. The arts are disarming. The, art, the arts are kind of elusive a bit. And when you're disarmed and all of a sudden you just watch the gospel story in this medium you weren't expected and your defenses are down and you can receive. Creativity. You don't change the message. It's not our message to change. But how is the message wrapped? What's it wrapped up in? That's why medicine manufacturers, like, you know, for instance, Pepto-Bismol, it tastes like candy. Dimetap tastes like candy. Why? Because, like Mary Poppins said, a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. Dimetap, that's just 
or Robitussin, that's just nasty. Don't, don't <laughs> take that. But, but think, about, you know, think about some of the evangelism methods that you've experienced. So what I want to do just, just very briefly is just touch on some evangelism methods that um, I, would just, I would gently say are a bit outdated. Not that they can't be used, not that they're not effective in some circumstances, but, but these are kind of, uh, I would say, models that are maybe in need of some innovation. Okay? So you've probably experienced many of these. One, and if you're noticing, I'm talking really fast because I have a lot of content to go through, so sorry. Um, one is door-to-door -door evangelism. You ever get a knock on the door? Now, this is very popular, you know, 20, 30 years ago, but no disrespect, the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, they've ruined this for us, okay? <laughs> Um, in all respect, I appreciate their zeal, but now because of you know package thieves, salesmen, right? We're very uh, we're very reluctant to open up doors. So if if God puts it on your heart, go for it. It's better than not doing it, okay? Um, but I think there are more effective ways. Secondly, tracks. Now, some of you, if you're maybe under my age, you don't even know what a tract is. But but during the 19th and 20th century, in particular, people would write these kind of catchy five or six page little mini booklets. And um, they were all often, you know, very creative, and um, you know, people would it would it would get them to really think about eternity and God, and you know, if you use those, great. But the problem is they're two D, they're static. We live in an era where video is king, right? Uh, so better than doing nothing. Thirdly, street preaching. Now um, I've tried this once, and it it didn't go well, <laughs> but I can say I've tried it. Uh, but there are exceptions. You can go on YouTube. You can watch people like Ray Comfort, David Lynn, Jeff Durbin, uh, who find creative ways to kind of street preach. But by and large, our society is not very open to somebody getting up on a microphone, right? It's kind of obnoxious. It's a noise violation, right? Fourthly, revival meetings, crusades. This was huge in like the, the 90s with Billy Graham, right? It's just thousands of people. And in parts of Africa still, you have huge revivals where it is very effective. People get healed. But during that time in the 70s, 80s, 90s, culturally, people had an understanding of the storyline. So when someone like Billy Graham preached the gospel, it was just, it was just tweaking something that they, need, that they already kind of knew, and they would give their life to Christ. They had the basic overarching storyline, and so a clear gospel presentation was very effective. Well, now people, people don't have that basic, those basics. And so you see a lot less of those kind of crusades or revival meetings. Uh, lastly, events in churches. Now, we're going to have a game day. It's going to be an event in a church. And it's going to be effective in reaching some people. That's why we're going to do it. But if you're not from a background where you went to church, you're probably not going to show up at a church. If I tell you the mosque down the street is going to have a really great speaker, really great food, and give out prizes to your kids, I would imagine you probably are not going to go because you don't go to a mosque. It's not a part of your culture. It's not a part of your, your background. So as great as events and churches can be, we're going to do them. That's one way. I think there are better ways. I do think there are better ways. My point is that all these things were relevant and creative at one point, but we need new, creative, spirit-inspired retellings of the gospel story. So, so far... And I realize I'm going, gonna, gonna go way over today. I am so sorry. I'm gonna get you out of here in like 10 minutes, I promise. Okay. All right. So, so far, I've pointed out how, hopefully, how Christians in America, by and large, were not evangelizing. Secondly, I've pointed out a few reasons why. Thirdly, we've looked at Ezekiel kind of a flyover. I've suggested creativity is a major key in delivering the most glorious of messages to a people who are spiritually blind. So now what I want to do in this last few minutes is talk about you. How can you, what creative method, again, we're not changing the message. The message of the gospel is timeless, but the way it's delivered, how can you creatively share this gospel message? And I have stolen this from Lee Strobel, who has creative evangelism styles. So what I want you to do as I go through these seven is you're not, I'm not suggesting that you do all of these. What I'm, what I'm suggesting is that you think about, oh, this one is me. This one I can do. So maybe there's one or two 
that fits your personality because I'm suggesting that all of us can share the gospel. All of us can take the unique wiring, our personality, and find a way to creatively share the gospel. So here are seven ways. And my hope is that this would inspire you to kind of think of new ways of your own. So first is kind of what we think of, I think, when we think of evangelism, is the direct confrontational approach. This is Peter. So for all these, I've, I've listed an example from the Bible. I've listed a modern day example, and then I've listed maybe an idea that you could incorporate. So in Acts chapter 2, Peter gets up, he preaches the gospel, he looks at these men, uh, and he says, look, you're responsible for crucifying Jesus. You need to repent. I mean, it doesn't get more direct and confrontational than that. <laughs> and certain people are wired this way. Billy Graham, various street preachers. In fact, one, statistically, 1% 1 of the church are evangelists. They, are, they have a special gift to evangelize. Uh, and they're, they're generally more direct and confrontational. So these people don't necessarily need creative methods because they're going to share it whether you like it or not, right? I mean, there's no bad moment. It could be Thanksgiving dinner. It could be at work in the middle of a presentation. They're going to preach that gospel. And let me encourage you, if that's you, go for it. You're the 1%. We need to learn from you all. In fact, if you're married to one of these people, or you, I know it can be uncomfortable. I know you're like, why is... You know, this, why is my, my, uh, my wife always talking to random strangers? That, let me just say, that's a gift. And as uncomfortable as it, makes, it might make you feel, a person who does not know Jesus and spends eternity in hell is going to be a lot more uncomfortable. So let these people run wild and get around them because some of their evangelism will, will uh, by osmosis, get on you. <laughs> Secondly, intellectual. Now, this was the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 17, he's in Athens. He's in a very sophisticated intellectual environment. So he's not, he's not preaching didactically so much as I'm doing right now. He's more reasoning. He would reason. He was talking to the Stoics and the Epicureans and the philosophers, and he was reasoning with them in the synagogues. And so, you know, you have examples of like C.S. Lewis, mere Christianity, Popular YouTubers like Preston Perry, who's an apologist. Rice Brooks, who's an evangelist in our movement, who's been going around to college campuses doing God's Not Dead events, seeing hundreds of people come to these events and skeptics, atheists, agnostics come to know Jesus. So if you're one of these intellectual people, uh, take, take a coworker through a book like Rebecca McLaughlin's Confronting Christianity. Or go through C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity with an Unbeliever and reason with them and go back, be an apologist. Some of you guys lo love, um, a, what is it called? Apolo Apo say it one more time. Apologetics. Apologetics, there we go. Which is reasoning for your faith. <laughs> Thirdly, testimonial. There is something powerful about your testimony. People can't argue with it. What are they going to say? Oh, no, you didn't experience that? Your life wasn't changed, Right? So Jesus heals this man who's blind in John chapter 9. And this man is, he's, he's uh, conversing with these religious leaders who know so much more about the Bible than he does. And they're jealous of Jesus. And this is what he says. He says, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. Hard to argue with that. Yeah. Something powerful about your testimony. If you go to IamSecond.com, you can see some really powerful testimonies. Jackie Hill Perry, you know, it's one thing to argue about LGBTQ and kind of that whole space, but she has a testimony of coming out of that community, being uh, saved and ministers in that community. Very powerful. Talked to a young man uh, who was formerly a Muslim, converted to Christianity, is working on his two-minute miracle or his testimony in two minutes so that he can share with other, with other uh, folks who are Muslim what God has done in his life. So an, an idea is like, if you go on a flight, you got two hours with a captive audience, <laughs> right? But maybe just get your story in two minutes so that when you're at lunch with a coworker or you're talking with a friend, you can share your testimony in a concise way. Fourth, invitational. So Jesus has this encounter with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. He reads her mail, so to speak. 
gives insight into what she'd experienced in a way that a human couldn't do, a human alone. He was both human and God. She's convinced of his divinity, gets saved. She goes back to her town in John chapter 4, verse 29. She says, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? She doesn't know anything about God. She's just, she's been a Christian all five minutes. But she can invite people to come experience what she's experienced. Listen, some of you, your most powerful ministry will just be inviting people to church. That's powerful. Maybe you can't articulate the story as, as well as you'd like, but if you bring people here or you bring them to an outreach that we're doing, they can hear the story. We do an event called At the Table. We're bringing young adults together in a kind of a safe, neutral space, having conversations. When you invite people to a moment like that, people can get saved. Service. How many of you just love to serve? You just, man, you want to you wanna take the trash out. You want to wash the dishes. You want to just, just show your love for people by your service. There was a woman named Dorcas in Acts chapter 9. She was full of good works and acts of charity. You can use your service as an entryway to sharing the gospel. That's what our grace loves outreach ministry is all about. We go, we feed people, we serve people on the front lines by giving them lunches, uh, we, we serve the homeless, and along the way, when we've met people's needs physically, we, we help share the gospel and, and meet their needs spiritually. Elise and I had a neighbor during the pandemic. We actually went to our row of townhomes. We got $10 Walmart gift cards, attached a balloon to them because that was when you know, nobody was touching each other. And we wrote a card and we said, hey, we're your neighbor next door. If you need anything, we're here for you. Here's a small uh, way to just to bless you. And we actually talked to a woman on her doorstep uh, who was really impacted. She said, can you pre please pray for my daughter? We prayed for her adult daughter who was going through some challenges. A year later, her daughter showed up to our church not realizing that we pastored it. This was in Sterling, Virginia. This was 45 minutes to an hour away. She stumbled into our church. She gave her life to Christ. The power of service. So maybe you serve coffee and donuts to coworkers one day. Drop off donuts to your kids' teachers at school. Maybe you come to our family game day and just serve. Let us bring the people here. You just serve them and, and we'll share the gospel. Two more here, providential conversationalists. You ever just have a moment you know was ordained by God? This was Philip, Acts chapter 8. He sees this Ethiopian eunuch reading the prophet Isaiah and saying, I wish somebody could explain this to me. I mean, come on, how easy can it get from there? <laughs> Elise and I, we sold a, a mattress on Craigslist. The guy shows up in his, in his van to our house. Holy Spirit whispers to me, this guy's going to get saved. This, y'all, this has happened to me maybe once or twice in my life. I don't want to pretend like this is a normal circumstance, <laughs> but this was a divine appointment. Had a moment, prayed for him. God revealed something to me about his son, gave his life to Christ on the spot. Providential, just as you're going throughout your day, ask the Holy Spirit, God, is there anyone you want me to talk to? Is there anyone that, that kind of stands out that you're asking me to approach? While you're on the metro, when you're in line for coffee, just have an expectation God's going to speak to you. Lastly, relational communal. Listen, there's certain, certain of you in this room, you're like relational magnets. You sneeze and like 10 people just want to be your friend. <laughs> Matthew, the tax collector, you also went by the name Levi. Levi made a great feast in his house, Luke chapter 5, and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. So he gets saved. He invites his friends to come and meet Jesus. Listen, hospitality is a powerful way to serve people, to invite people into your home, to allow them to experience the love of Jesus. <laughs> this is funny. When we were, the most effective ministry thing that I've done, when I graduated college, my wife and I, I had a good friend. He, I'm very pastoral. He's very evangelistic. So he would invite people to his home, and me and Elise would just love on him. And so we called it the chop shop. We would have everybody bring ingredients. We would make a meal and chop it up literally, and then we would chop up a passage of Scripture. And people came far from God. One young man is now serving in our staff in Chantilly. 
one couple who were so far from God, they now are saved and they went to Denver with David Hermes and are part of his church planning team. I mean, just incredible stories. Just by opening up our home, loving people, serving them food, doing life together, that's the power of community. Our generation, our, our t today, before it used to be you had to believe and then you would belong and then you would behave. Now, often it's you behave first. You go out and, sh and maybe you help serve. Even though you're not a Christian, you go out and do grace loves. And along the way, you belong. Oh, wow, this is my community. This is cool. What are these people about? And then you end up believing. You give your life to Christ. Okay, so we've gone through those. Let me just ask you, do any of those resonate with you? Is there maybe one or two that you could say, I, that's me. I could do that. So here's what I want you to do. This week, just think of evangelism. I don't want you to start anything. I don't want you to do anything necessarily. I just want you to think. I want you to be on, in prayer this week. And next week, next Sunday, we're going to have like a commissioning moment. We're going to challenge you. We're going to encourage you. You're going to be inspired. You're going to be ready to just take over the world for Jesus. Amen. All right? But this week, just pray. If you're, if you're that 1%, you're ready to go out there right now. I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> but for the rest of us who might be terrified of this, God can help us. God can inspire us. Amen? Father, thank you. Thank you. You've given us the greatest story that's ever been told. It's not a uh, fantasy story. It's not a Disney story. It's, it's a truth. What your son Jesus Christ did on the cross. We want to not only live it, we want to preach it. We want to find creative ways to tell that story. So God, help us to do that. Inspire us this week. Help us to think, what can we do with the people right around us? In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Guys, lastly,